It's been almost two decades since Alexander Dagg played in the NHL, and I'm not sure if his name has crossed my mind more than a couple of times since. But you should know, for a period of time, Dagg dominated the hockey world. His brilliance got him drafted first overall. Failure to live up to those expectations inspired commentary from every corner. Today, Alexander Dagg returns to the spotlight, telling his story on The Chirp with Darren Millard. Boys, I'm Mike today. Just let everyone know, don't say anything stupid. Huzzah! Oh, how'd that feel, old man? That's a disgrace! That's a disgrace! What a joke! Hit him, hit him, light him up, light him up. Yeah, nice hit! That's solid. Welcome back. We're at the worldwide headquarters of the Chirp Podcast, uh, located in Las Vegas. I mention that, remind you of that, because there's actually a connection between today's guest, Alexander Degg, and myself, as we have the same buddy, a mutual friend, uh, who is a mover, a shaker uh, in Las Vegas. And uh, we'll mention that in just a little bit and how it all ties in. He's a hockey guy, loves the game, and it's uh, really neat how there's uh, basically three degrees of separation inside uh, hockey. This episode dropping days before the debut of the documentary Chosen One, Alexander Day. The film documents the incredible rise to fame of a French teenager and then the subsequent failure by Dag to meet the expectations that go along with somebody who's drafted number one overall. And you should know, Dag wasn't just drafted first overall. He was a sensation. He was a generational talent. He was everywhere. His face, his name, uh, interviews and highlights, and the media followed him. It was as dramatic as anything you are going to see today. However, Alexander was out of the game by the time he was 25. And while he would eventually return, his story had basically been written. Chosen One debuts on Prime Video in Canada on January 26th, a day later on ESPN+. Plus. If you're listening to this fresh after it was released, that's coming up this weekend. Watch the documentary. Or if you're a couple of days later, it's in your library. It's probably available right now. Again, Prime Video in Canada and ESPN+. Plus. It's part of two documentaries in association with NHL Productions. The other being Saving Sackick, uh, which follows an attempt to sign Joe Sackick away from the avalanche. Chosen one in Deg, you are going to hear the same charismatic personality that we remember from the late 90s and the early 2000s. But both the documentary itself and our conversation really will clarify some of what was happening behind the scenes. It's his story. It's one that might actually turn out differently today. But he owns it. Here's Alexander Dagg on The Chirp with Darren Millard. Hey, let's start here. What are you doing? Where are you living? What, what's going on in your life? Um, I met my wife in 2004 in Montreal, so that really set the, uh, a life chain event. <laughs> <laughs> I'm familiar. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's familiar. I, I, you know, I lived in LA for a long time. I came back during the lockout uh, to do some charity work, uh, some hockey games we did here. Met her, came back to after the lockout to uh, Minnesota. And we moved to Davos, played four years there. We got married, a couple of kids, brought them back, and we lived in Montreal ever since. And I work for a company called Attraction Media. We do TV shows uh, for the French market, and we have an office in Toronto that we do TV shows for the, uh, the English side. So, and I'm an uh, executive producer in a couple of shows. So that's do you what like I do. that? There you go. That, I love that. I yeah. love that. For six years, I was into the rental business, like the yeah. t the um, uh, you call that um, lenses and cameras and lights and all that. Oh yeah, and sound stages in Montreal. Uh, I liked it, but I didn't feel like it was you know because you, you're by yourself a lot. And I think brainstorming and, you know, like, you know, in production, you, you get a lot of people around. So I really like that. All the heat that you took for Hollywood and being into other things. And, and it's given you your, your second career, right? Yes. Yeah. Keep coming back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but for me, uh, I think the Hollywood thing, just to make it clear, I, I finished hockey. I finished the season in April, right? Every year because we never make the playoff in Ottawa. 
So a April 15 or whatever, I'm done. Where do I go? I, you know, I'm not going to go to Montreal. Like the that's for temperature is terrible at that time. And 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 when you're a hockey player in Canada, it's tough for people to well, not your sports, and people understand. It's very you know, it's hockey, hockey all the time. So you go to Miami and you go to to New LA. So for me, LA was a natural, and plus they had they, they were starting to have a lot of hockey players living there. And training them, uh, training there at the time, a guy named T.R. Goodman. I don't know if you know him. Oh yeah, that was, that was yeah. He was running it at the at the um, Gold Gym over there. So we trained with him, and and, and Pat Pat Brisson obviously became what Pat became now. But Pat started with Luke, and that that agency grew and grew and grew, and it was all out of uh, Venice Beach. So uh, it was a great great setup, and I loved it. Then I don't want to talk about it, but I think the nice the nice life. It was amazing in the '90s in in Hollywood. <laughs> Plus, the bar they closed at two, so you know at one point you got to go home. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are other places that you can go to. I've I've been to a couple of those. Uh, th this project was it your idea? No, no. It's uh, Jay Nelson and Ross Bernard at the league. Um, Jay was the producer. That was his idea. They pitched it to Prime Video. Uh, they pitched some different stories, and Prime decided that uh, the Joe Sakic um, signage and 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 the story behind uh, covering that contract for Colorado mm -hmm. that was the story they want to feature and my story. And when they called me, they said, "Alex, uh, will you be interested?" I said, "Yeah, you know, if I can have a little bit of the narrative or I can say my side of the story, would be awesome." And it started with that, and after that, it became. Very uncomfortable quickly, <laughs> I can admit, because, uh, yeah, they want to feature, but, you know, they start featuring, and then I was sitting down in, in New York, and that, you know, they have a little, not a conference room, but a place, uh, just a screen room, screening room, and they started showing me a lot of the bad things that I did and when I was an 18-year-old, but I think it was very therapeutic for me, because when you're 18, you see it that way, and it's stuck in your head for 30 years, and just looking at it, Jeez, man, I really cut some slacks to myself. I said, geez, it was not that bad. And it was just, you know, a little kid coming out of high school, being set up into a, a, a big, big company called the NHL and Ottawa new team. It was so intense. And geez, that kid had no chance. Like dealing with that was super tough. So that was one of the components. The other component was my kids. They have no clue who I am. <laughs> no clue. They're, well, that's the way with every every dad, though. You're always just dad. It's crazy. It's crazy. And plus, you know, the highlights from the '90s. If you look on TikTok or Instagram, it's almost non-existent, right? So yeah. they don't know. <laughs> um, so they see my sweaters. I get a couple of sweaters downstairs in the pool room, and it's like, ah, oh, geez, man, they, I can't wait to watch it with them. That's one thing because I think you know there's an emotional component as well. But at least they're gonna see some highlights. They're gonna see who I was. Uh, so that's great. And my dad was another thing. He died last year, but just before he died, we did that interview with him. Um, and, you know, just for, I always felt that he had a bad shake in all this because when you're a dad, you're a dad through and through. And I retired for two years, middle of my career. Uh, think about it. It's going back to work in, in, in Canada. You only talk about hockey every day. Mm -hmm. So now the subject is your son is retiring at 25 was first overall and all that. It was super tough on him. So, so that was one of the things that I wanted to correct in a sense that, you know, it's not his fault. You know, that's how I felt. And that's how, that's how I thought it was the best course of action for myself. And the other thing, I think just him telling me how proud he was of me and, and the way, you know, so that, that was a great moment for me. It was awesome. In looking back at it now and watching the documentary after living, reliving uh, what you went through, is there yeah. anything that could have saved you or, or got you through that process? With the help they have now with the league uh, and the teams um, and every sports now, you have the sports psychologist attached to the team, plus the nutritionist and all this. This is like standard, but the sports psychologist, I think it's the main tool that would have helped me. I think for me, it was more, you know, because just to finish on my dad, that was the component. Like he pushed me, right? Mm -hmm. He never pushed me. My dad is the most paused person I ever known. He, he show up to every practice, every game, never coach, never skated in his life. So it's like, 
That's one of the component. The other component, Alex never loved hockey. Are you kidding me? Like I breed and live hockey still to this day. I play twice a week. I'm like, I love it. But at that time, my brain, it was not fun playing hockey. And just having that reset for two years changed my the course of my career. Of course, in the NHL, but I had way more fun after than I had before on the ice. So, yeah, having a sports psychologist to, just to retool, just to, for me, it was resetting goals. That's another component. You start hockey, you're eight years old. So you go from Adam to Pee Wee. That's a big step, and you're looking forward to it. Pee Wee to Bannon, big step, because now body check is implemented. So it's stressful. You're excited. You'd make it. After that, it's midget. Okay, midget. So now it's across Quebec or across Ontario, all the best players. Okay, you make it. Next is the draft for the, the, the Q, right? Or the WHL or the OHL at that time because the, the, the college component was not, was not a factor. And you make it. Oh, man, geez, okay. Now you make it to the NHL. You're going to be in NHL for 15 years. And that's the top process. Okay, but what's next after? Like, there's no next. So now you got to reframe. Okay, every season you got to get. So that was, for me, the toughest thing. The toughest, toughest thing. You take great responsibility for everything during the documentary, and uh, I give you credit for that. But there's also two villains, the media and there's the hockey people, um, whether it's managers or coaches who you would say stuff and they would they would answer back and you'd be gone after that or the next day. Uh, what What's your opinion of the media first? First of all, <laughs> media have to do their job and their job is to – get the best story for their audience which is it an audience that likes uh, the flashy stuff is it an audience more factual whatever whatever it is so when you're 18 you don't understand that you think they're the bad guys and you don't use the media as your tool you use them as the enemy which i think is stupid you know because i don't believe that somebody goes into a media business thinking that he's going to be an evil person <laughs> like it doesn't work that way Thank you. So, <laughs> you. You know, you can trash and trash people, but at the same time, I don't think that's part of the DNA. And for me, I didn't understand that part. I didn't understand that people didn't like me. I didn't understand. But at the same time, I was an 18 year old guy, very cocky, very sure of himself and with no real life experience, just living life. Every day was a different day and with no plan ahead. So for sure, media would have been tough. Uh, and media, for me, I didn't understand it. Now I do. I'm 48. But yeah, so that's my media answer. And you really got caught in the vortex of hockey being an ultra conservative sport. And we are. I'm I'm part of that. I'm conservative. Yeah. But if you show personality, uh, sometimes it's accepted. We're getting better. But you got hammered by it yes but it was 30 years ago mm -hmm. i think now people realize that the league realizes it. i think the new gm the new coaches are younger uh they understand they have to deal with people with a lot of money and they have to deal with them differently and i think people and players will have more success being on social media and really put in their best foot forward uh on their own doing they're going to attract way more uh I like using the money, money, money thing, but yeah, they're going to use more. They're going to get more sponsorship. They're going to, you know, it's going to be mm -hmm. a richer experience. So, it, and it's all good for the league. 30 years ago, it, 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 no, it doesn't work that way. You got to be in line and that's the way it worked. And all the coaches were older and the management. So it's just timing was off for me on that, that front for <laughs> sure. For sure. What was the most fun you ever had in the NHL? The most fun. It's my first year. Yeah. We, Even uh, though the the world was spinning around you and there was all kinds of attention and it didn't stop. You're doing yeah, but I, I, English, I French. You, on, on a funny level, it's just that Ottawa didn't have much money, so we didn't travel. We didn't travel private, so we had a commercial flight after every morning after every game. So we no stayed way. in every city. <laughs> <laughs> That's why the fun. It and goes back to we, L.A. Yeah, that's how I discovered LA. But for me, it was, you know, I, I went to Vancouver in a hockey tournament in Boston, and I went to the World Junior in Sweden. Those are the only travel I made in my life. 
So now I'm going to every city. I'm staying over every night. I'm going to the best restaurant after every game. It's like, it's amazing on a personal level. I mean, like it's yeah. amazing. Uh, that's the amazing to hear that side of it uh, and the benefits of staying overnight and not flying charter. Uh, your yeah, son... but the, the team got smart and they, you know, they squashed <laughs> that idea. <laughs> There's so many Alex rules here uh, between the, the rookie cap and, and now flying charter. And uh, I always thought it was just convenient. It was so but funny because it... one year I got, I broke my arm. I think it was my third or fourth year or whatever. And Jacques Martin was is the coach. And he's back again. I said, geez, Jack, unbelievable. Yeah. Keep bringing you back. But he, uh, he said, Alex, he said, listen, he said, I want you on the I want you on the road with the team. You know, I think it'll be great. You know, guys like you. I said, yeah, man. I said, it's a great, great, great idea. First trip in Miami. <laughs> so after the trip, he said, no, nah, I don't think that I don't think the road is a good idea. <laughs> So Jack, I'm not playing. I, I know you're not playing, but uh, I think it's a good influence. Let's put it that way. Do you think it would be easier for you today in this climate than it was 30 years ago? Because 100%. of yeah, 100 percent for a couple of things. Okay, hold on, because a, a lot of people say it's harder for players today, but this is interesting how it's unique that it would be easier for you for you. It'd be easier because I would have the. The, the support, the mental support that I needed at that time. So that would for sure change the trajectory of my career, 100%. Um, it will be tougher for sure on the personal level because I think at that time, but, you know, guys are linked differently as far as the relationship and going out and meeting people. Um, but I think I will be accepted within the group. The group is more made of people like my type of personality or there's more into every team and it's, it's okay. So for those elements, I think it would be easier. And another, really the most important thing, they took out the red line for my style of play. Oh, there. It's magical. You know, it's like, geez, uh, yeah, man. I, you know, sign me up. <laughs> it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> your, your son's playing. You, you yeah. guys are going to go to All-Star. Who does your son want to meet? Who do you want to introduce him to? So funny because my son is uh, – it's not as exuberant as I am. So I asked him two days ago. I'm still waiting for the answer. So it's between two guys because Tampa Bay is his team. So Kucherov, but he knows like McDavid and Team Canada. So it's between those two. So I should have the answer by the end of the week. End of the week. Yeah. With kids, who knows? And it might change three times before you actually <laughs> uh, you actually get to, to Toronto for the All-Star festivities. Uh, was there any hesitation to putting him in hockey? Oh, no. No, no, no. no. Hockey's awesome. I think it's... Yes. For me, I really want him to play a team sport. So he play, yeah. he play he plays soccer and hockey. For me, it's awesome. I think, you know, just having that chemistry and meeting people. My son is kind of shy. I was shy when I was younger. I think it helps you getting it out and meeting new people. Every year is new people most most times. I don't know. Yeah, that's and it's good discipline. You gotta be on time. You gotta, you know, it's a team thing. So I, I love everything about hockey. What's th the message from the chosen one um there's a couple message first of all seek help you know as far as mental goes and, and where you are in your career i think that's going to be a huge boost i think that's undeniably a, a thing you should do um and i'm very grateful for the i think people were <laughs> a little bit taking it back i think that i'm super grateful and happy the way like uh, First of all, I live my life and the opportunity I had in the NHL and every, you know, that's the only reason, that's the reason I live the life that I live. It's because I played hockey and I play in the NHL. It's awesome. So I just didn't want to have things out there being all negative. It's super positive. It's like, geez, man, seriously? So that's one of the two big components I would like people to get out. That's wonderful to hear. What would you say to Connor Bedard if I put you guys in a room? Um... I think I, I thought about it because I, for me, I think the blueprint, when I started, I have a blueprint of a young player coming into the league and how you should act, you know, how you should put people around yourself. If I look at Cindy Crosby, that's exactly the way you should go about things as far as the, the Penguins. You arrived there, Mario was still in town. He owned the yeah. team. He brought him in. 18 years old. Forget it. Don't forget. This guy was, high, was a high school student last yeah. year. Like he goes to Pittsburgh. You can't go to the bars. He's 21 years old. So you got, you gotta, you can't be at a 
by himself in his room playing video game. He can't be. He's got to start growing up. How do you do that? You got to be around people that live and breed the game. And Cindy was very fortunate to have Mario around. And that's how you embrace a young kid. And after that, it's just bring some media training and being really focused on your game. And if you have any hiccups, just consult. Now the league is super open. I saw three or four players, you know, getting out of the team for a couple of months and coming back. And, and it's like nothing happened. And people, it's just part of life now. So that's awesome. So that's, that's the, I think that's the way to do it. And if you follow that path, you won't have any problems. Personal one and a connection that you and I both have to finish. Brendan Brisson just made his NHL debut. Yeah. And scored his first goal. Like you you've known him forever. What yeah. what does that like watching him reach his ultimate goal? And he did it against Sid. Yeah. No, it was um, you know, for sure, you know, for me, Pat was a big part of my life, especially on the second part. Yeah. And and just for you to for the audience to understand, is I had two, maybe three agents in my career, four. A, and he's the only one who still texts me. You know, Pat is a different breed, and that's the success is not just. Uh, you know, I didn't write him a check for the last twenty five years. He still texts me, <laughs> and like it's like, geez, man, really? <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> so, and I want to put another perspective: is this kid grew up in Manhattan Beach, in California, which the excess and the opportunity to just go on different paths was it was there and and those kids stuck with hockey and went to practice and really worked hard for everything they got it's not because pat is a super agent that they got that you know that gift and that willingness and uh i think it's pretty remarkable so that you know tap off to pat and kim i think they did a great job with him and he's going to be successful do you lead your league in scoring twice a week no actually i'm playing defense i realized that you shut never down guy well, when you lose, you never look at the guy who shut down people. You look at the guy who didn't score. So <laughs> now that I'm getting, I'm getting old now because all the guy, all the retires are 35, 40. So I play with all the ex hockey players. So there's some good players out there. So easy, easy. Uh, well done. Congratulations on the show. I think this is going to really help people. Uh, even current players today going through this, they watch this. It gives them all kinds of perspective, uh, opens their eyes a little bit. Congratulations on this. Thank you. Thanks for having me, guys. So to explain this, uh, Randy, Randy is Randy Morton. He is a mutual buddy of uh, mine and Alexander Deggs. He's one of the most influential people in Vegas, a Canadian from Peterborough, and uh, now lives down here. He was a longtime COO of the Bellagio, the Bellagio Fountains. He is an absolute Vegas legend in the hospitality world. He also worked for the Golden Knights for a period of time. That's where I got to know Randy really well. And now he's on to a new project with the Oakview Group, a small world, uh, this hockey world of ours. Now, uh, for The Chosen One on Prime Video and ESPN+, Plus, uh, check it out. Uh, it is launching this weekend, the 26th in Canada, the 27th in the United States. It's a... Uh, education, but it also relives a period of time. If you're an age bracket uh, like mine, uh, you will remember a lot of what was happening in and around, and it does touch on uh, all the hot buttons, and you'll realize what I mean uh, by that. Uh, I, I was at Sportsnet in Canada during the days of Degg's NHL time, and I remember sitting there uh, admiring his personality, wondering if uh, we would get a chance to talk to him, because he looked to be able to be his own person, and he was. He was different than the typical hockey player. Never once did I really, because that's not my job, right? You don't take into account what everybody's going through, that he was having to handle interviews in French and English, and he was the face of a franchise. You just heard about the money, you saw the skill, and you saw the brilliance and said, uh, life must be absolutely great. But he didn't come within an ocean of living up to expectations. And I, I, at the time, I put that responsibility on Deg. Was he focused enough? Were his priorities in line? You read the different stories. You heard the commentary from uh, people within the hockey world, whether it was Bob Clark or uh, folks from the Ottawa Senators, a couple of different uh, categories uh, particularly. Uh, but 
to put it bluntly, Diggs' love for the game, after all that he went through, is one area and one opportunity that I'm glad is answered through this documentary because it's different than my perceptions back in the day. He owns what happened to him. And I don't know if things would be different if Dag was coming up in the 2020s instead of the 1990s. It's too easy to say that he would be a star right now and would blossom. Maybe it would turn out exactly the same. We can't judge that. But the tools, and, and Alexander mentioned this, uh, Alex said the tools that are in place for the athletes today are incredible. They're saving careers. And I appreciate that he gets that message out as well. He, he was honest about his hockey and where he was a, at the time graduating in the National Hockey League and how he had trouble motivating himself a, at that period. But he was also uh, honest about how he liked to live life to its fullest. Yeah, L.A. was uh, funny, the, the going on the road with Jacques Martin, uh, the first road trip to Florida, uh, was funny. So he, he doesn't walk away from that, and that's something that uh, you will appreciate in the documentary, Chosen One. I'm even happier. This is, this is my biggest takeaway from, from the conversation and the documentary, but the discussion with Alex. He still loves our game. And I didn't think that would be the case. I, if there's anybody that ha- would have an excuse to be jaded and not want anything to do with our game, it would be somebody like Alexander Degg. And he still plays. That's awesome. Like Eric Lindos, who, who skates a couple of times a week, still does drills before he does uh, his scrimmage. I, I'm absolutely so appreciative that they have the same passion even after their playing days are done, to still be involved and skate. Some guys never never play again. Uh, these two guys uh, had up and down and controversial careers at times. Uh, Eric Lindros, Hall of Famer, still loves the game. Alexander Degg, still following, still playing, uh, even though uh, he's a defenseman. I won't hold that against him. Uh, he's not the only French-Canadian star, though, that's uh, in the spotlight right now. How about Patrick Waugh returning behind the NHL bench? His tactical skills, his X and O's, that knowledge shouldn't be overlooked, but it it is. Uh, Because the self-confidence and the passion from Patrick will always lead any conversation about the former goaltender, now coach. Not once, not one thought did I have that Patrick Waugh and Lou Lamorello would ever be a fit. But Lou surprised me once again. And I, I do like this decision. They're, they're a bubble team right now. They're in a brutal competition to get into the Stanley Cup playoffs. And maybe it's that passion. Because I don't know how much tweaking you can really do with 30 games left. But that passion, that enthusiasm, that drive uh, is infectious. Uh, I watched it in junior hockey when he won multiple Memorial Cups. I was there uh, First time I met uh, Patrick Waugh in Quebec City when they hosted the Memorial Cup, but then I was part of the, the Memorial Cup championship, which he won. Alexander Radulov uh, was the uh, the player, uh, and Patrick Waugh, as the coach back then, was intimidating as a coach to the other teams. Uh, he can do it all. That part of him, being able to motivate athletes, might be the biggest benefit to the Islanders right now. And then the tactical side uh, in years to come, uh, as they forged their relationship with the New York Islanders. He did say, and this is going back to last year's Memorial Cup championship when he was uh, finished coaching with the Quebec Ramparts. Uh, remember, he was in pseudo-retirement uh, when when Lou Lamorello gave him the call. But Patrick said uh, at that Memorial Cup, uh, when they uh, created the upset and, and won again, that he admitted that he was wrong in that uh, split with the Colorado Avalanche in his first go-around he said all the right things, and he demanded too much power back then. And if you're going to coach in the NHL, you have to be a coach. And that might be why some of those comments uh, at that Memorial Cup in Kamloops are a big reason why I think that uh, Lou Lamorello reached out to him and, and made that decision. Uh, we'll see where it goes and whether or not 
Patrick Waugh can lead the New York Islanders through a, uh, a very stiff uh, and crowded competition to make the Stanley Cup playoffs in the Eastern Conference. Uh, did Lou make the, the best move? It sounds like it. Did he make the move because other people were going to be poking around Patrick Waugh? Yeah, and I don't know whether uh, other teams are really at that stage yet, but Los Angeles is a club that's fallen off, and I really am impressed with what Rob Blake did to give Todd McClellan a vote of confidence. Uh, It lets the Kings coach approach his job without walking on eggshells. And proof that that's taking place is how he's handling some difficult decisions like the challenge of handling the first-year L.A. King Center, Pierre-Luc Dubois. He's not shying away from that. And I don't know how much. Now, Todd's a veteran coach, and maybe it works the same way whether or not he gets the vote of confidence. But uh, he doesn't have to worry about his job. He can just try to get this team back on the right track and uh, and into the Western Conference playoff picture. It, it It's kind of uh, exaggerated a little bit what's happened to Los Angeles because of how Edmonton has come back into the playoff picture in the Pacific Division. I don't know whether they can get to a home ice spot in the Pacific and the Western Conference, but what they're doing right now is unprecedented, trying to maybe run the table in January. But one observation, and I'll leave you with this, what Edmonton's done in creating franchise history that surpasses the Gretzky years is incredible. And I would have expected Connor McDavid to actually be challenged for the NHL scoring lead after a surge like that, but he's still arm's length away. And that is proof that it's not just all on McDavid, that Edmonton is doing this in a different way than they have in the past. And I also like the Corey Perry acquisition. Uh, That's a power play that is so productive. And now there's an annoying factor in it because Corey Perry stands in front of the net and he's a net front presence and they can score in different ways. And uh, wouldn't it uh, be interesting if all the skill in the world and they put Corey Perry in front of the net and he puts them uh, over the top. I think they're a a much more dangerous team with Corey Perry and uh, they were able to, because of uh, what's happened this year, be able to make that situation work. So uh, wishing Corey Perry the best of luck uh, with them and uh, another uh, high-level player involved with that uh, Edmonton Oilers team, and uh, we'll follow it along and see whether or not they can continue this run up the standings. They're going to be in. I didn't think they'd be in top three by the All-Star break. That's uh, happening. Uh, can they get to a uh, potential home ice spot? Uh, that will be fun to watch. Uh, really appreciate uh, what Bob Bender did this week in being able to make Alexander Dag happen on the Chirp Podcast. Check out chosen one alexander Degg, on prime video in canada and espn plus in the united states uh, let me know your thoughts of the documentary and of course uh, love to hear your reaction to uh, Degg's discussion with me today thanks for listening to the chirp podcast with darren millard